So if you're watching this weekly review with me now, you've identified yourself as one of the hardcore of the hardcore supporters of Ukraine, because all I'm doing here is reading headlines and maybe giving a little commentary about the headlines from last Sunday to this present Sunday. Uh, so last Sunday, December 3rd, uh, the headline, the first headline that we talked about was that ships face Houthi claimed at, uh, attack on Red Sea as officials say a U.S. warship also fires in self-defense. Putin would love nothing more than the U.S. getting embroiled in the conflict in Israel and Gaza or the broader Arab world being sucked in as well as the U.S. being sucked in. That would be wonderful to him. Uh, Ukraine says an apparent shooting of surrendering soldiers was a war crime, and it clearly appears to be that uh, there were Ukrainian soldiers' wives protesting because they want to send them home. They said the others should be getting mobilized. Their, son, their sons or their husbands should be coming home. Um, now, again, there's a, a certain war fatigue in that sense there. But you see the same thing in Russia where <laughs> women were uh, protesting and what was happening there was that the Russian government was actually paying off these wives in order to be quiet because Putin doesn't really want that to be seen as a thing. Um, so uh, Ron Johnson, he is a U.S. senator. He said, uh, well, let's put it this Russia-Ukraine war will end in a negotiated settlement, he said. Um and he said, quote, he, he has nothing but sympathy for the people of Ukraine and nothing but contempt for Russia and President Putin. But he thinks that, quote, Putin is not going to lose this war, unquote. The war has to end, Johnson said in the interview. And, quote, we're not going to like the result. But every day that goes by, we're going to like the result less, unquote. So he wants to give up and create some kind of um, resolution to this sooner than later. On the other side, you had John Bolton, who also worked for Trump, who argued that the U.S. must act quickly uh, on additional aid or Russia will win. Quote, I think that we've got to be very concerned about Russian diplomatic offensive that tries to win over at the bargaining table with Russia, what Russian troops can't win on the battlefield. And that's a great point. That, that was his quote. So you have different factions forming, and you're going to see... The big story writ large this week is the political factions that can't seem to get along or can't seem to agree and can't seem to come to, to terms. Monday, December 4th, the Bulgarian president vetoes donation of armored vehicle personnel carriers to Ukraine. I'm not sure exactly what the background is, but his statement said that we want to make sure that these aren't uh, vehicles that we're going to need somewhere down the line, which makes sense. But was there something more to it? Uh, undermining Ukraine that was motivating that. Another article, miscalculations, divisions, marked offensive planning by U.S. and Ukraine. So this was in the Washington Post, and I, I spent an entire video on this because it was important. It was unpacking the differences in how the U.S. saw how the battles should be going in Ukraine and how Ukraine thought about it. The U.S. wanted to focus and concentrate their efforts and punch through the lines. The Ukrainians wanted to attack in three different places in order to spread the lines out to, to have a greater success of having a thinner defense in order to punch through the lines. Um, and then a lot of it was talking about how maybe there was some friction between U.S. officials and Ukrainian officials, but U.S. officials essentially going, well, you know, Ukraine, you have to live with it. You, you're going to have to determine how to do it. But that was the essence of the story. But it comes on the heels of the Economist magazine and the Time magazine article. And so it's it's one thing after another, making it politically look like things are going a lot worse than maybe they are. Ukraine war, a soldier, uh, a soldier tells BBC a frontline hell. And it's just, I mean, if you read these kinds of articles and just like, wow, how how difficult it must be to be on the front line. It's, it's a very uh, sobering thought. I also talked about the 20 days in Mariupol, and you should watch 20 days in Mariupol. And by the way, feed me other documentaries if you think that uh, there's something that I should be talking about to say, hey, watch this or that kind of thing. L let me know. Russia seeks to take the eastern Ukrainian stronghold at any cost as Kiev gets worrying news about Western support. We're talking about Avdivka. Um, I think Putin wanted it for a some kind of victory lap, and 
he wanted to have that before he announced, but he didn't get that. And uh, he will want that before the election, but we'll see whether he will get it or whether he'll just uh, have to abandon it after so long. Tuesday, 5 December, Russia has recruited over 100,000 convicts since the war began. Just wrap that around your head. Somebody about this time last year, and I know it was about this time last year because my son was, uh, I was reading the comment at my son's basketball game practice. And so that's where I was actually reading the comment and he just started practice again. Uh, so it's around this time of the year. I said, wow, it's kind of evil genius to be using these convicts. I mean, if you take the morality out of it and you'd have to take the morality out of it, but, you know, you get rid of the prison population, you send them to the front line. If they win, great. If they don't win, it's not that big of a thing. Like, if you take the, the moral aspect out of it, it, it is kind of. But it's kind of a whole different level of evil to be doing what they're doing and to use be using these convicts. And, and those that got their freedom went home and started pillaging and doing evil things again because they shouldn't have been out of prison uh, it's a it's a really interesting thing to watch all the way around. Investigative stories from Ukraine as Zelensky's deputy chief of staff lives in a villa owned by people tied to Yanukovych. Now, this was in an article from um, the Kiev Post, and, and I thought it was really interesting. And I think it's uh, awesome and telling that the Kiev Post would put an article like this out, not because I wanted to give Ukraine a black eye, but because they're willing to expose whatever corruption or whatever appearance of corruption. I don't know that there was corruption here after reading the article, but it certainly doesn't look good that uh, his deputy chief of staff lives in a place that is probably four times more expensive than what he should actually be able to afford, but and owned by the former president Yanukovych. And so it's like, but exposing it is important. Getting the corruption out of the sunlight is the, is the greatest disinfectant, and, and they are trying to root these kinds of things out. Another article, not flattering, Kiev mayor uh, Vitaly Klitschko claims that Ukraine's leader is becoming an autocrat. This was uh, in France 24. Um, now, Klitschko may very well have some presidential ambitions uh, or other political ambitions down the line. Um, and that, that might be much driving it. He's also a little frustrated with Zelensky because, uh, in, in the Ukrainian system, as I understand it, the states are arms of the, of the national government, but the cities are operated independently. And so they're kind of, they kind of clash and they're at odds a little bit. I also remember Zelensky chastising him for not being able to keep certain things running in the city last year. And so maybe there's some bad blood. Um, but okay, so that's that's the pol the politics internally. Another article. This is EU. EU must not appease Viktor Orban by unfreezing billions earmarked for Hungary. And so I think that's what Orban's deal is. I, I, now he's cozy with Putin. He wants to keep that relationship with Putin. Keep the the sweet cheap oil flowing to him and gas and that kind of thing. Um, I, I I think that's part of it. But I think Orban actually is after the money that has been blocked by the EU. And I think that's why he's being the gadfly that he is. Republicans are prepared to block Ukraine-Israel aid package if border policy changes are not included. Okay, we talked at length about this, but the short answer is, while Republicans should just do this thing for Ukraine, what they're doing is a natural political process that I wish they weren't engaging in right now because time is of the essence. And so they're just... Uh, Biden has blocked them for the last three years on anything related to the border. And now they see that they have Biden a bit over a barrel. And if Biden really wants this, he'll give them that. And uh, not just Biden. Biden's not the only one. The Senate Democrats and uh, the Senate uh, and, the, and the House, they have a slight majority. So they're good there. But if the Democrats want this, then they'll give the Republicans that and they'll come to a deal. I'm confident that they're going to come to a deal. I don't know what the deal will look like. I don't know when, and I wish it was sooner than later, but that's the political process and how it works. They, they always, there, there's nothing, you never get rewarded in politics for solving a problem ahead of time. 
You get rewarded in politics for almost creating a crisis and then fixing it at the, at the last hour. And this is why congressional approval rating is generally very low. House Speaker Johnson's insisting on sweeping border uh, security changes in a deal for Ukraine. Republicans close ranks, demand Democrats face a border crisis as uh, Biden Ukraine aid plan hangs in the balance. Clock ticks down on Ukraine aid as Senate border talks falter. Zelensky to set to brief the Senate on Ukraine aid needs ahead of supplemental vote. And then that didn't happen. Zelensky canceled the U.S. Senate address amid a Ukraine aid dispute. Uh, I read an article that uh, where the Ukrainian ambassador explained why, but didn't explain why. <laughs> like there was no crisis, so it just we just couldn't fit it in. You could have fit it in, I'm pretty sure. But it was good for him not to have addressed the Senate just before that thing blew up. It would have looked even worse had he done that. He will be coming to town tomorrow. Um, he'll be coming to uh, D.C. tomorrow and hopefully he'll get a hearing and and uh, Biden will put him up in front of some uh, he'll, he'll come to the White House. He'll also come and visit some uh, congressmen and we'll see how that all plays out. Uh, Ukraine deal shift toward the fence as analysts ask whether a failed counteroffensive is over. So the counteroffensive didn't work out as well as they were hoping. I mean, it, they didn't really get the traction that they really wanted to get. And um, but they are shifting to the fence. And I've seen some language where uh, Zelensky was talking about uh, shifting toward the fence. And this is at least in the in the short term, a necessary step to prevent the Russians from doing more while they are low on on uh, resources. Uh, we had a line in something uh, where s some artillery man or something was talking about how little artillery pieces he had to fire. And the comment was that uh, artillery or ammunition builds confidence. <laughs> to, so if you have it, you have a very different feeling than when you're when you feel like you're running low on it. Um, okay, Ukraine is making its own howitzers, and now they need shells. So it's good that they're building these things in country. Now, at the same time, uh, there's other things happening in the world. So Maduro ordered, this is in Venezuela, the president of Venezuela, ordered the immediate exploitation of oil, gas, and mines in Guyana's, that's their next door neighbor, Guyana's Esquibito. Esquibito is a uh, Esquibito. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I don't pronounce a lot of things right. I'm sorry about that. Um, but this region is in their next door neighbor's territory and they're making a claim about it and blaming the U.S. and Old Mobile Exxon or Exxon Mobile for um, having caused the problem. And uh, yeah, so a war kicking off there is another thing that Putin would really love because it would, again, take off eyes away from Ukraine especially American eyes. Uh, West, uh, Wednesday, 6 December 2022, Ukraine, USA together can create an arsenal of freedom, says Zelensky in a speech. And they're working toward that. You, uh, European leaders are trying to stop Orban from derailing Ukraine's accession to the EU. Senate Republicans are blocking procedural vote for Ukraine aid package. Remember, in the Senate, they need to have 60. That's the rule. It, it, it's not a 51 you know, vote. It's, a, once you, it's not a simple majority. They've had a standing rule for a long time in the Senate. You need 60. The, while there's a slight majority in the Senate, they need a few Republicans to go along. And if the Republicans stand united in order to get what Republican priorities generally are, like the border, then they can't actually move anywhere. Uh, you, uh, U.S. Congress votes. Zelensky office admits Ukraine may lose the conflict if, they're, if they don't get something. That, that was in Pravda. And you know, notice the way that it was phrased. It wasn't like, hey, we need help or something's going to happen. No, Zelensky office admits that Ukraine may lose the conflict. USA allocates 175 million arms package to Ukraine. That's not a whole lot. So that's a very tiny package, but it's at least something in the meantime. Uh, Ukraine claims killing of ex-trader MP uh, in Russia. And then they also blew up the car of an LPR deputy uh, on the same day. So they're active in other ways, but not making ground in the, you know, taking territory back through a counteroffensive like they were hoping to do uh, since June. Russia presses on with a drive of Ukraine. By the way, let's go back to that last comment that I made, taking the ground since June. 
part of the conflict between the U.S. and the Ukrainians was that they, the U.S. wanted them to move faster. The Ukrainians were like, hey, we don't have the, the material or the brigades trained up yet. And so the delay uh, gave Russia extra time to lay mines and to create trenches and dragon's teeth and all kinds of things, which made it more difficult. And not being able to get through now means that it's it, pretty much everyone's uh, anticipating a much longer war than they were anticipating just six months ago. Okay, let's keep going. Russian forces are killing their own wounded with drones to stop them from surrendering, officials say. That is absolutely terrible. Um, Ukrainian forces launched successful drone strikes against Russian military installations in occupied Crimea. Uh, RT talks about how Venezuela mobilized their army in looking at Escobedo. Okay. Thursday, 7 December. Russia warns that U.S. and Ukraine will be its second Vietnam. Now, when the CIA chief equivalent, whatever the Russian equivalent of the CIA chief is uh, warning the U.S., hey, look, you know, this is going to be your second Vietnam. One, no, it's not. Um, it might be Russia's Vietnam or the equivalent for them, but it's not going to be for the U.S. All the U.S. is doing is supplying uh, dollars and weapons. That's it. Um, but when he when he's doing that, you got to ask why is he doing that? What's he what's he want him to do? It's oh, it's a friendly warning. So you're you're you can you're concerned about me? No, it's trying to get him to stop doing what they're doing. Two Russian officers sentenced to four years each for failing to repulse a Ukrainian attack. This was a Ukrainian attack inside Russia, I believe in Belgorod, and it's weird that they were getting sentenced to jail for that rather than just like losing command. It's it's a fascinating article. Government calls on Ukrainians to reduce electricity consumption due to power shortage, and that's going to be an on-off thing moving forward until the Russians can be prevented from you know, attacking uh, electrical grid and things along those lines in the future. Number 10, that's in Britain, number 10 Downing Street, urged to investigate the targeting of MPs and others by Russian spies. Okay, so this is an interesting cyber attack. Um, it's called Star Blizzard. And what they're doing is they're trying to hack these MPs and other important figures in order to really monkey with them through cyber means. David Cameron urges U.S. Republicans to send Ukraine more long-range weapons. I think that's a good thing. Um, it's one thing when someone who's also a conservative like David Cameron urges Republicans to do this, when a liberal or American, um, you know, a congressman who's a Democrat urges them to do it, it kind of falls on deaf ears because you're the other side, you're the opposition. He's not an American conservative, but he's kind of seen by conservatives as on our side. And so it's a good thing for him to be doing in order to, uh, get that message across, uh, and hopefully it'll it'll have some effect. Yermak Stefanchuk, Stefanchuk and Umarov, forgive me, I've, I've never been able. Yermak and Umarov, I'm been e uh, easier to pronounce. I've always had a hard time with Stef Stefanchuk. Um, meet Blinken in the USA. So the, that's the head of the president's office. That's the speaker of the Verkhonorada. That's their parliament and the Minister of Defense were meeting with uh, Secretary of State Blinken. Um, they were meeting with him this past week, and Zelensky will be there this week. New aid pledges for Ukraine fall to the lowest level since the start of the war, a report says, and that was in CBS News. So, so we have to do something about funding sooner than later. Friday, 8 December 2022, the, U, uh, the EU agrees to enable member states to end all gas imports from Russia. So um, now Russia's going to sell. They're just going to sell to other players. Uh, they're going to say it's going to be a harder thing for them to do. And they're going to like a pipeline going directly to Europe is a lot easier and cheaper than putting it on boats and sending things out that way. Um, there's not a pipeline to China that I'm aware of, at least not yet, but there probably will be eventually. And uh, they'll be happy to send to China and India and anywhere in Africa and whoever else wants to buy that's not sanctioning them. Biden, the closer, Senate GOP urges a uh, uh, president to clinch the Ukraine border deal. Like, let's, let's, get, let's get this worked out. Now, remember, Biden was 36 years, I think, in the U.S. Senate. 
he's he and McConnell have been there together so long that they they know each other's language. Like let's let's work out a deal, and they're trying to work out a deal. Um, Biden has no formal authority here, but he can make something happen if uh, if. I, I, I'm confident that they will make something happen. They just have to figure out what they're willing to give up on either side. Um, and again, I, I don't want to see this scenario. I think this is a bad look. By the way, I saw this on um, Fox News two days ago where a commentator was talking about, look, Republicans are going to make a deal, fairly confidently saying uh, the Republicans are going to make a deal. They, they know it's going to be a bad look if they don't support Ukraine with this package and Russia uh, concludes the war and they are blamed for it. So they, they have an incentive to do it. They're just trying to get their, um, their border package to be passed. Okay. So that's what, that's what's happening. I think that I'm, I'm fairly confident that that's what's going on. Okay, Germany delivers fresh military aid package to Ukraine. They were stepping up in the meantime. It's not everything that they need, but it's something, and each each contribution adds up. Ukraine to make shells with U.S. firms as it seeks to develop a, se a defense sector. They signed some kind of agreement. Of course, this isn't going to actually, the, the uh, organization that's going to be creating this won't be up and running for another two years, but it's it steps forward. Uh, EU aims to grant Ukraine aid even if Hungary vetoes it at the coming summit. So they're, they're working on a workaround just in case. Russian presidential election to be held for three days for the first time. So that's unique. Um, but again, <laughs> part of this is that, uh, and Putin, next article, Putin is to run again for president in March 2024. Now, I talked about that briefly um, in, in one video, and I'm about to talk about it again because there's more nuance to it than what we saw before. Um, yeah, well, I, I just wait for that video. Putin and the opposition, everything you need to know about the 2024 election in Russia. And like, okay, so the big takeaway there is that there's about five characters running against him. Nobody knows any of these guys, these guys' names that they're not going to make a dent. Putin, however, wants to have huge turnout and he wants to have huge percentage simultaneously because that's what, you know, when you're kind of a dictator and a little bit full of yourself, that's what you want. You want to show like you have this mandate. It will actually show the opposite. It will show that he's more corrupt uh, because of that. Like you, you just don't have that kind of turnout in the United States or in the in Western Europe, where you have free and fair elections. Russian troops are attacking Advika on foot. Ukrainian tanks are waiting for them. Advika. I mean, I just I can't understand um, why they keep doing what they're doing at Advika. Other than that, Putin wants to take it so that he can say, see, we've captured this key territory. Um, and it's just, it, it, it's a waste of human life. Ukraine to make shells, we just talked about. Okay, so Saturday, uh, December 9th, 2022, Parliament adopts a bill on improving selection of judges. This is part of this anti-corruption effort in order to move into the EU. This is in Ukraine. Uh, Kiev removes a monument to a Bolshevik military commander, Schlors, Schlors, I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that, S-C-H-C, or S-H-C-H-O-R-S, who was apparently oppressing Ukrainians, um, and uh, then he died shortly thereafter, and they're removing the monument, putting it in a museum somewhere. Kiev expects delivery of F-16 soon. But further aid remains stalled in Congress, and the Ukrainian parliament approves three bills uh, uh, related to as EU accession talks. So they're moving. It's got to be maddening to think about all the plates that are spinning simultaneously with the war and economics and the politics and what's America going to do and where are the other hotspots around the world. And we have to keep moving our legislation or creating legislation to move into EU accession at the same time. And they're doing a masterful job moving that direction. But wow, that's just, it's got to be mind numbing to think about all the moving parts. Okay, Sunday, 10 December 2022. Russia is stronger uh, because of the Ukraine war, Sergei Lavrov claims, as he says, the West's 500 years of, domina of domination of the world are coming to an end. Okay, so that 
that statement was actually quite telling because that's the way that Lavrov looks at what's going on. That it's just, you know, it's Europe trying to oppress Russia yet again. And we're stronger on the other side. It's a really interesting perspective. Like Russia has this, we're the awesomest and we're also just so embattled on all sides, kind of bipolarness going on all the time. Uh, Ukraine Vol Volodymyr Zelensky heads to Argentina, hoping to win Global South support. So he, he did go to Argentina, uh, the inauguration of the somewhat right-leaning, but again, you know, we use these terms left and right, and people have pointed this out in my community tab because I asked where they stand on the spectrum. They don't necessarily mean the same thing in the same places, right? Same thing with conservative and and what it means in the United States as opposed to what it means in Europe as opposed to what it means in Russia may be very different things. And yet there's this confusion that a conservative in the United States thinks, oh, or Bond, he's conservative. And <laughs> no, they're they're different in the way. And I know some of uh, some people are going to say, no, 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 no. Uh, they're all fascists or they're, like you just don't understand that there's there are principles that cause people to think one way or another. And that has nothing to do with authoritarianism or fascism or whatever else. Um, do some things look alike? Sure, some things look alike, but there's there's really a difference between what a conservative here is and what a conservative there is, and the the confusion in the language causing them to like think that they're the same. That's that's frustrating for me to see that. Um, okay, uh, Zelensky to visit the White House after stopping in Argentina to bolster support. So Zelensky was down there in Argentina at the inauguration of this right wing. Uh, president, but he's actually doing something really smart. He's trying to pick up support from Argentines and others, mixing with others there that he can speak to about, like, the global South is important and it's being politically won by Russia more than not, especially in Africa, where Russia is very involved. So if he can neutralize some of that with some Latin American support, uh, that would be a really useful thing for him to be doing. Then in a couple of days, he's going to be coming to the United States. Republicans are to meet allies of Hungary's Viktor Orban and ending uh, on ending Ukraine aid. This is a meeting with Orban. This is meeting with some allies of Orban and meeting that. I talked about that yesterday, uh, and I just can't understand the connection here between these. I just there's a connection between Orban and the Heritage um, Foundation through the Danube. I miss I misspoke yesterday. It wasn't the institute in the article that I was talking about. It's the Danube Institute is the institute that um, the Republicans or that the, that the Heritage Foundation is connected through. But why him? I just I just it, it's very frustrating to see. Okay, it's not just Ukraine. War is on the rise everywhere. There was an article in Bloomberg that went to the IISS um, and showed just like how many conflicts there are around the world. And those conflicts are growing. I mean, they, they really are. Last article with aid in doubt and advances slow Ukraine struggles in the war's new phase. And that was a Radio Free Europe article. But that's that's right. It, we're in a very slow down tempo phase. And um, it's a good thing that we're right now in this phase that they that they're having these ar arguments about funding now rather than when they really really need to have the shells on the ground. So it's it's good thing that the winter has caused that to be. Okay, that was a lot. I mean that was that was more than normal. But thank you for sticking with me. If you're still here, like I said, you're the hardcore of the hardcore. Thank you for listening and sharing and subscribing and um, being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.